Hey everybody, Pastor Cameron here. We want to welcome everyone to worship and we want to welcome especially our guests. If you are a guest here with us in person or online, we do want to remind that we do not ask anything from you financially. We just ask that you join us in worship today. Uh, for our members, we just want to give you a quick reminder that there are multiple convenient and easy ways to give whether that be in person or online. And if you go to our website at TroyFirstBaptist.com and you go to our Give tab, it's gonna give you three different options. And we're gonna just remind you of those options real quick. The first way to give is you can give in person or you can send a check through the mail to 401 East Main Street in Troy. The second option is to download detailed directions for our text to give option. This is where all you will need to do each time to give is to text a number and the system does the rest of the work for you. Or you can choose the online option, which will take you to our online donations. If you choose the online donations option, regular tithes and offerings are labeled under general fund. If you would like to give to a designated fund, all you have to do is click and choose that specific account that you would like to give to. For example, if you would like to donate towards the youth casual trip and either pay for a half or full trip for one of our students, all you need to do is choose that fund, add the amount next to it, and choose today's date at the bottom. When you click continue, the system will prompt you to put in your information and your card number. The system is simple and easy to use. Remember church family, if you ever need any help giving tithes or donations, or if you ever have any questions, you can contact myself or the church office at any time. Again, thank you for joining us today. Let's worship together. Well, good morning, Troy First Baptist Church. Would you do me a favor? Will you stand and sing this song with us to our God?
here are just a few things to remember in the next coming weeks. Good morning, and welcome to Troy First Baptist Church. Here are a few announcements to add to your calendar. The Caswell Coffee Bar is back and will run from 9 to 9.45 a.m. on the 24th and 31st. If you are unable to make it indoors, we will have a drive through available just for you. Drive up next to the kitchen and a student will come out and take your order. Come and give to a great cause. If you would like to help our students go to camp but cannot make it to the Caswell Coffee Bar, we have a few ways to donate. If you would like to pay for a trip for one student, $250 will send them to Caswell. $125 takes care of half a trip. If you would like to donate towards a half or full trip, of course, any size of donation is appreciated. Youth, make sure to be here at 5.30 for tonight's youth service. And parents, don't forget that Christ Center Parenting starts at 5 o'clock. Also, make sure to check out our online adult service every Sunday evening at 6 p.m. on either our Facebook or YouTube. At Troy First Baptist, we take a country every week and pray for it. Today, we ask that you take a moment and pray for the people of Iceland. In 2007, a Bible program helped deliver the word to many across the nation. Pray that many more would come into contact with the word of God and become believers themselves. All right, just a few things just to, um, just to, to echo. Uh, students, whether you're here in person or whether you're at home, we are talking about anxiety. And that is the pandemic that's been happening for years. This pandemic that happened before this year and uh, anxiety affects so many students. So whether you're here in person or whether you watch online, our, our um, service is gonna be online and in person for youth tonight. So make sure, and parents, whether, again, whether you're here in person, whether you're home, make sure to uh, take a look at that as well. Uh, next week when we have our Christ Center Parenting Meeting, we're actually gonna discuss um, what our students talk about tonight, and our students are gonna actually tell me what their biggest anxieties are tonight, and we're gonna go over that next week. And that's just wildly important. But let's pray for our country this week. Heavenly Father, can we pray for this nation, God, and we pray for all of our brothers and sisters. We pray that you would raise them up, and we pray that you would touch every single person. God, make your kingdom known. We love you, and we praise you. In your name I pray. Amen. Will you stand and sing with us?
Spirit. that you would lift us up, that you would convict us this morning, that you would start to mend us into who you would have us to be. God, and I pray that as we live and as we are sanctified with each and every day, God, I pray that this city, this nation, this world would look more and more like your kingdom. God, we love you, and I pray that our actions would show that today. And I pray that our feet, our mouths would prove that as we leave these doors. It's in your heavenly name we pray. Everybody said. What is the heart of the matter when someone is having a hard time getting to the point, we might ask them, okay, what's the heart of the matter? We're not talking about a heart, of course. A literal heart is that pump in your chest. It is the core of your circulatory system. More often we use the word heart to talk about the figurative, fanciful seat of our emotions. And that's the way we usually use the word heart. Someone has a big heart or has a heart of gold. Someone has a hard heart or a heart of stone. We might have a bleeding heart or a heavy heart or a broken heart. Your heart might be in the right place. Your heart might be in your mouth. You might wear it on your sleeve. You can be faint of heart, young at heart. You can cross your heart and hope to die. You can have your heart taken or you can lose your heart. You can open or close your heart. You can bear your heart, follow your heart. And of course, you can eat your heart out. I don't know what that looks like. Someone else can steal your heart, warm your heart, break your heart, melt your heart, or find their way into your heart. When we talk of the heart, we are usually not talking of the literal heart, but the figurative heart. But there is a third way we use the term. And it just means like in the heart of the matter, we're talking about the center, 
the core, the central, the most important thing. And today I want us to get to the point of what it's all about, the heart of the matter. Like in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, the author of Hebrews says, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. Here's the heart of the matter. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. It's all about Jesus. Imagine it took him eight chapters to get to the main point. So what is the main point of Troy First Baptist Church? And this January, we are looking at the heart of the matter. Why are we here? Is there not a cause? What is our purpose as a church? And of course, we have given to you the past two weeks the secret hidden purpose found right on the cover of your bulletin every Sunday for three and a half years. Knowing God, changing lives, connecting with each other. That's what we are all about. And the first thing that we are about are those two words, knowing God. We want to know God ourselves. That's discipleship, spiritual growth. And we want other people to know God. It's all about knowing God. That's very important. And here is what it is not. It is not serving God. Here is a very prominent misconception. It's very possible to say the right things, to do the right things, and not have our hearts in the right place. Jesus says in Matthew 15, 8, These people draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. Jesus says we can even serve him and miss the point, the heart of the matter. It's not about serving him. Yes, it's important what we do. James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. God wants us to not be just hearers or sayers. He wants us to be doers. And to be a sayer and not a doer is to deceive ourselves. Yes, it's not what you say, but what you do that is important. But that's not quite the heart of the matter. Because Jesus also says in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven... Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Notice not everyone who talks the talk walks the walk. You see, a walk talks and a talk talks, but a walk talks louder than a talk talks. But even a walk is not enough. Jesus says there are many who not only say but do. They prophesy in his name. And he also goes on to say, they not only prophesy, they cast out demons in my name. They have done many wonders in my name. But he says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice, you do, but you practice lawlessness. Notice these are ones who walk the walk. This frightening passage you've never really read or understood until you have read it and put yourself in the place of these people. Would you be surprised to be one of the ones that Jesus says, depart from me? Do you truly believe you belong with Christ's sheep? These ones truly believed it. Is it possible that you, like them, have missed the point, the heart of the matter? So if it's not serving God, what exactly it is, uh, that's important. But like the bulletin says, plain sight, it's all about knowing God. It's loving God. The heart of the matter is knowing and loving God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4, 5, and 6. God says to them at the heart of all of this is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these, which, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You can't just say or even do what the law says. It's not about defeating the enemy. It's not even about serving God. It's about knowing me and loving me. It's also in the New Testament. Moses gives them in Deuteronomy at the parking lot of the promised land. It's all about the heart loving God. Jesus also says it to his new people. 
as he is at the parking lot of the kingdom, he says in Matthew 22, 36, when he's asked, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? What's the heart of the matter? What's it all about? Jesus said, here's your answer. And he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Jesus tells us what is essential in the church. Jesus tells us the most important thing. And Jesus today wants me, he wants you to not miss the point. It's not about serving him. It's not about what you say. It's not about what you think. It's not even what you do. Now, here's the good news. This is something that you not only need, but something that you want. This is not only something that our neighbors need, but our neighbors want. As a matter of fact, we were all made for this. This is not going to be a hard sell in trying to get people to know God. They were created in God's image to know Him. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, Now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Now, if you ask people around the world, what do they want? They'll give you usually one of three things. Here it's faith, hope, and love. Or the top three of the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace. We don't have to try and sell people things that they don't want or don't need. Everyone wants to know love. And really, isn't that what this is here? Everyone wants to know hope and that change, changing lives. Everyone wants to know love, connecting with each other, peace with God, peace with each other. These three things are just like our purpose. Who doesn't want something or someone to believe in? On our evening services for the past few weeks, for the month of January, we're looking at hope. We all want hope. But here in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, The greatest of these is love. We were made in God's image, and this is what it means. We were made to love not something, but someone, and to love someone eternal. Our hearts were made for something bigger than things, for pleasure. We were made for and made to love Him and others. We will see over the next two weeks that all three of these things, knowing God, changing lives, and connecting with each other, are what this world wants and needs. We are getting to the heart of the matter. We're getting to the heart of the chart we've looked at the last two weeks. I've said that everybody knows what they do. Ask someone who they are, and they'll probably tell you what they do for a living. But what you do is not as important as how you do it. And a few people, the teachers, they know how to do what they do, and they can teach others. But the ones who are self-motivated, the ones who never lose their purpose, are the ones who know why they do what they do. And here, we move from the all who know what, to the some who know how, to the few who know why. Friends, the why is love. What you, your neighbor, everyone in the world was made for and, and looking for, and you don't have to convince them they need something they think they don't. You will be revealing to them what you know they really want and need. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, God, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of, not gloom and doom, fullness of joy. At your right hand are chores, jobs, busy. No, pleasures forevermore. God didn't come to make our lives a drudgery. It's not like eat your vegetables, they're good for you. No, this is the good stuff. And notice, it's more about what you say, more than what you do, it's what you are, it's your why. It's not about what you do, it's about what you are. It's not about doing, it's about being. Doing is exhausting, but being is energizing. Let me tell you, about how I learned this powerful truth. This is my testimony. Let's go back and start it again. Here is my testimony. This is the younger me from three days ago telling you how I learned this powerful truth. I was sitting in the living room. Here we go. What is the purpose of life? I asked her. 
I was sitting in the living room of a young lady in my first church who had just tried to take her life and her wrists were bandaged because she had cut herself and wanted to die. And here I was, a young pastor, about 24, and there to counsel her. And when I asked her why she wanted to die, she didn't know why she wanted to live. And I asked her, what is the purpose of life? This was one of the most important days in my life because as I counseled her, I ended up counseling myself. I said, why are we here? And she gave me all the reasons that she'd learned in church. We're here to read the Bible, to pray, to give, to tell people about Jesus, to go to church, all the big five, the things that Christians are supposed to do. And I realized that's what I'd been living for, doing all these things. And as I counseled her, I really was counseling myself. I said, actually, I've done all those things all my life, but that's not what it's all about. I'd never really gotten it until that time. I didn't get it growing up. I didn't get it in Bible college. And now I was a pastor and I was getting it as I told her, you know what Jesus said when he was asked, what's the most important commandment? He said, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. And as I was telling her that it was about having a love relationship with God, I was really preaching more to myself. I spent all of my life trying to earn God's love, God's favor, by doing all the things that I thought he wanted me to do. And I realized that I'd been doing that for the wrong reason. And I covenanted with the Lord that day, Lord, I wanna to spend today and the rest of my life learning how to love you. When I put the horse before the cart and I loved God, then I did all those other things that I was doing before, but now I was doing them for a different reason. I realized that religion had become a rut for me reading the Bible because I had to, praying because I was supposed to, going to church or telling people about Jesus or giving my tithes because I was guilty if I didn't. But I realized if I loved the Lord, I would do all of those things and they would come naturally. And that made all the difference. What I told her made a change in her life, but it made an even greater change in my life as the Lord showed me something that had been there all along. I wasn't here to serve God, God already had servants in the angels. He made Adam and Eve, he made you and I to love, to befriend, and to be loved. And that's made all the difference in my life ever since. My testimony is not that I gave my heart to Christ as a child for salvation, but later on, years later, when I was a pastor, I gave my life and I realized it was about loving him I had missed the point. Is it possible that like your pastor, you've missed the point and you've spent years of drudgery trying to serve God, being one of his angels, his servants, when God made you to be his friend. Now, heaven forbid I tell you what it's all about, the heart of the matter, and not tell you how to love God. Sometimes preaching is all about the what and not about the how. I've given you the why, but how do we learn to love God? In John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17, there is this famous passage where Jesus turns to Simon Peter and says three times, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Now, if you know the story, you know that Peter got hurt Peter got frustrated that the Lord kept on asking him, maybe even insulted. But the truth is, Jesus is asking you and he's asking me today, do you love me? If you love me, everything else takes care of itself. And what is your answer? If you are honest with yourself, if you've been trying to do something less like serving him, let me tell you, I had to relearn a lot of things in learning how to love God. I had 20 years of practice at serving God. I was really good at that. I knew a lot of things. I did a lot of things, but I had to learn to draw near to God. James 4, 8 promises, if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. The problem was not him, the problem was me. And so I had little experience in really loving God, a relationship with God. I had a lot of experience in religion. So I asked myself the simple question, okay, God, let's start from the very beginning, a very good place to start. 
How do I get to know, how do I get to love somebody else? Well, I have to spend time with them, right? And so, but first, I guess I got to get right with you. Some people, they have to get right with him. If you're a unbeliever, you've never made things right with Christ because of your sin, you need reconciliation. Romans 5.10 says, If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. First things first, you have to trust Christ for salvation. You can't be his friend if your sin comes between you and God. Jesus Christ solved the sin problem by dying for our sins. And you can't be best friends with someone you are enemies with. And so to overcome that, you need to be reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus. In Acts chapter 16, someone asked Paul, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? His answer is the same as I would give you today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did on Calvary's cross for you, and you will be saved, you and your household. You need to be forgiven of your sins. And that only comes not through works, lest anyone should boast, but through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. God's grace provides the gift. By faith, you receive the gift. But let's get practical here. How do you then love him when you're made right with him? And that takes spending time with him. First, you have to spend time with him by listening to him, and you listen to him in Scripture. It says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, This book you shall meditate in it day and night. Not just read it. You shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according. Now, it means you're not just going to read it, but you're going to let it change your life. And yes, you're going to do something about it. You're going to be a doer, not just a hearer. But observe to do all that is written in it. Now, can I ask you a probing question? How can you do all that's in it if you've never read all of it? I'm afraid to, to ask today, how many of you have read every word from Genesis to Revelation? There would probably be less than half hands in here. How are you going to do all of it if you haven't read all of it, let alone meditated in it? For then, if you meditate in it day and night faithfully, and you do it all, then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. You know, you can't know somebody unless you spend time with them. And how does God speak to us? Oftentimes we think God is speaking to us when it's really just ourselves saying, well, what God wants me to do is basically what you wanted to do anyway. Sometimes WWJD, what would Jesus do, is just our way of saying, well, Jesus would do what I wanted to do anyway. But the way we can objectively find out what Jesus wants is what did Jesus do, WDJD. What did Jesus say? And we find out in his word so I had been reading my Bible through, not only once a year, but I was a pastor and I was a super spiritual Pharisee judging other people. I was reading the Bible through every month. Ooh, I was super spiritual, but I didn't really know the author. I found out I wasn't impressing God or anybody else. And now I started to read the Bible differently because I knew the author and I loved the author. When you love Jesus first, it's not like reading the newspaper. It's not like reading a blog. It's like reading a love letter from your love. You read over it and over it and over it because you care about the one who wrote it. You not only listen to him, but you also talk to him. And how do we talk to him? Of course, in prayer. It's not just a gimme list. It's not just a our Father which art in heaven memorized ritual. Luke 6:12 convicts my heart. It came to pass in those days that Jesus went out to the mountain to pray. What did he need to pray for? He continued all night in prayer to God. Do you think he was asking for his daily bread? Do you think he was asking for fun things? Or do you think he was getting alone with his father and spending time with someone that he loved? The question is not how long do you pray, but what do you do? Why do you pray? And when I learned to love God first, prayer became more natural. Bible study was easy for me. I was reading through it all the time. But prayer was harder because I already knew God knew everything I was going to say before I said it. And he already knew better. And I was probably asking wrong. And I just kind of thought myself into this vicious cycle and said, boy, I'm wasting my time. But then I realized I loved the Father and I wanted to talk to him. And I haven't 
enjoyed my day until I've told it to my wife. I haven't enjoyed my day until I've told it to my Lord. And so I would just take time to spend with God every day since that day. If you love someone, you not only want to spend time with them, you also are considerate, you're sensitive to their feelings. And I realized that I would have to turn from sin, not in order to get into heaven, not in order to get rid of my guilt complex, but because I didn't want to hurt the heart of the one that I love. There are certain things that I don't do around the house because I love my family. And so certain bodily functions, certain things you might want to say, you just don't do. Things that hurt or bother my wife, I try not to do them as often as I can. Well, that's what turning from sin is, isn't it? First John 5, 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And notice, his commandments are not burdensome. Oh, you don't like that? Okay, no problem. I love you more than that. If I love him, I not only do what he wants, but I love it. I do it not because I have to. I do it because I want to. It's not burdensome. It is turning from sin because I'm sensitive to him. And it also means that when I hurt him, I confess sin to him. We all sin. Even as believers, we still make mistakes. We make on purpose sins. 1 John 1, 9 tells us, if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't confess our sins to have our sins forgiven because theologically we know he's already died for all of our sins, forgiven all of our sins, past, present, and future. Lord, you've already forgiven the sin, but I'm confessing it to him, which means I'm making it right. When you confess to a police officer a crime, you're turning yourself in and telling them something they don't know. When you confess to God, you're not telling him anything he doesn't. Oh, are you the one who did I was wondering who did that. No, no, no. When you confess to a parent, you're not asking that parent to take you as their child again. You're not confessing to your husband or your wife and saying, would you please not divorce me and would you remarry me? When we confess to the Father, we're not asking him to save us. We're not asking him to do something he hasn't already done, forgive our sins. We are making things right with him. So we confess our sins and we agree with, that's what the word literally means, we agree with him. We don't get born again. When I make things right with my wife, I don't ask her to marry me again. I just restore the relationship. And so keep your sin account short. Don't do what I used to do. I used to, I used to confess my sins once a month or once a quarter when we had communion and we prayed before the bread and the wine. No, no, I realize that you want to do that on a consistent basis. Lord, is there anything that I did today that hurt your heart? Lord, I want to agree with you about that. Help me to not only confess it, but to forsake it. It makes a difference in your life. And I confess, not because I have to, but because I want to. And yes, when you get to the placing the horse before the cart, you will also serve him. Being loving to him does mean serving him. Love means giving, after all, doesn't it? John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave. Loving, in one word, is giving. And so if I love him, I will serve him. But don't serve him so he will love you. Does any parent want a child to come to them and say, Mommy, Daddy, I cleaned my room. Now do you love me? Oh, that would rip your heart out. Oh, dear son, daughter, I love you whether you clean your room or not. God doesn't want us to serve him so he will love us. He wants us to serve him because we love him. Romans 13, 8 says, He who loves another has fulfilled the law. If there is any commandment, all are summed up in this saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Verse 10, love is the fulfillment of the law. Notice it's not just the things that you don't do, but it's the things that you do, and it's why you do them. And why do I do that? Why do I not do certain things? Because it's wrong, it's naughty, because it'll make God mad, because I'll go to hell. No, because I love him. Why do I do the things I do? You see, love needs no law. And in our house, there's not a bunch of laws. All right? You ever go to a house where there's a bunch of laws up on the refrigerator? That's not a happy place. In our home, we have one law, the law of love. Well, if you love, you won't do this. If you love, you will do this. And so in our home and in your life, you don't need a bunch of laws and rules and regulations. That's what religion is all about. But a relationship is about love. 
Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, that's obvious. Put love first and you will keep the commandments and they won't be, as 1 John 5, 3 said, burdensome. You will be what you were meant to be, what God wants you to be, what you want to be, and not because you have to, not because you're going on a guilt trip. You will keep the negatives and the pos positives because you want to, not because you have to. Friends, what I'm telling you is that when you get down to the heart of the matter, it's the heart that matters. So I'm asking you if you have already given him your heart in salvation, I want you to get to the heart of the matter and spend a day and the rest of your life loving him with all your heart. That's the point. That's what it's all about. That's why he died. Not just so he could get you out of hell, not just so he could get you into heaven, but so he could love you and you could love him. That is what it's all about. Today, instead of singing an invitation, I would like to sing for you, with you, if you know the song, one of my favorite Christian songs. It's called Knowing You. And it goes so well with this message that I thought um, I would sing it for you and teach it too if you don't already know it. I think I have the words on the screen up there. Let's, if you don't know it, you can watch the words on the screen. But this song gets down to the heart of the matter. All I once held dear, built my life upon all this
Jesus loves us, but Jesus longs to hear us say, I love you, Jesus. You love Jesus, but does he know? Do you ever tell him so? Jesus longs to hear you say that you love him every day. Would you tell him today by the way you speak? Would you tell him personally? Maybe you haven't told him in a long time. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? You know he first loved you. Lord, thank you for loving us. We love you because you first loved us. But Lord, help us not to miss the point. We spend the rest of our lives loving you. Thank you for loving us. We don't deserve it. And Lord, we'll love you forever because of it. But Lord, help us to remember the why in all that we do and all that we say. Amen. Today we have a business meeting, but I'd like to remind you first of our evening message tonight, which is found on YouTube and our Facebook page before six o'clock, and it is in our Hope Stimulus package, Don't Lose Hope. You know, it's a shame to lose hope. You lose your keys, you lose your glasses. Don't lose hope. Don't give up on hope. And uh, tonight from Jeremiah, we'll learn how not to. A very important uh, uh, informational meeting, and next week we'll vote on it. And we'll turn it over to our moderator, Jason. Member, I have a motion from Brian Hampton. Do I have a second? Second from Mr. Fred Taylor. The motion is second. All in favor, say aye. Any opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Do we have any church letters? All right, no church letters. We'll move on to the financial report. Uh, this time I'll look for a motion to dismiss with the reading of the financial report and accept them as printed for the month of December 2020. Do we have a motion? Have a motion. Do we have a second? Motion on a second. I believe second was Bonnie. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Any opposed like sign? Motion carries. At this time, uh, we do have a recommendation from the deacons. The deacons recommend that the church sign committee present their recommendation to the church Sunday, January 17th, 2021. That's today. Um, and the vote by ballot be held on Sunday, January 24th, 2021. This time frame will give church members more time to gather information, view drawings, think about it, discuss it, and pray about this important decision of informing others about church programs, schedules, and outreach to our community. I'm going to turn the floor over um, to Mr. Earl Poole, but before I do that, I do want to mention that, again, next Sunday is the vote. We are, again, going to allow drive-through voting um, that's still considered in-person voting because you're here at the church. Um, so there, you will be able to drive through the uh, carport or vestibule, whatever that term is, the area in between the youth building and the fellowship hall. Uh, drive through there and submit your ballot um, if you are listening remotely. Uh, you will be given that option. So at this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to Mr. Earl Poole. Um, again, uh, some time ago in Deacon's meeting, and I can't exactly tell you when, but anyway, we decided as far as, uh, you know, making the church outreach the community better, we needed a larger parking lot, we needed a new church sign, it was number two on the list, and if you think about it, looking at our 
functions. Our job is to advertise what we do. And so the thought was, was to come up with a modern electronic sign, which you can see over here on, on the easel. Uh, the height of this sign will be, number one, it will be red brick uh, to match the church and the memory garden. Uh, John Thompson is our contractor who has done a lot of work here. I don't think I've ever heard a single complaint about the quality of his work. It's always very good. Uh, if you look at the sign over here, I'm not used to teaching far away from my prop. I usually go over and get close to my prop. But anyway, if you look at the sign, of course, it has an arch in it. Some will say it has approximately a height of 7 foot 6 inches tall. Its width will be 2 feet. Uh, its length from one side to the other is going to be 12 foot. At each end, there's columns, which will be two by two. In the interior portion where we have this electronic sign will be eight foot. Again, if you look in the center, you will see the heart of the matter of the sign. Uh, you'll see a Cirrus LED system, four by eight foot screen. LED, and I can't go very far on this because my physics in, the, in this area is not good, but it's a light emitting diode system like you see on any nice sign. This one will, will meet right up with the ones that you, you see in Times Square. Um, it can be programmed. We can either run a wire to the church, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, or you can program it with the cellular device. Again, we'll have a code, so not just anybody can program the sign. Cost. Uh, the cost is approximately $42,000. Now, again, I use the word approximate because as you know, building prices vary, materials vary, and unfortunately, usually they go up, but occasionally they go down. Um, the cost is basically, if you look at the brick part, what is the enclosure for the sign, is going to be about $11,000. And that includes the, all the brick work, the electrical work, getting the permit to build. The LED sign in the center is $31,000. Now, that is the expensive part of the process. However, we looked at other options, and really in the electronic world, if you don't get the best, you're buying obsolescence because you think about it, how much things has changed. I grew up with a big TV, with a big TV tube, and we went with that for years, and then it disappeared. And now we're down to basically disposable TVs. I mean, things have really changed. So we can program it to do whatever we like. I mean, it'll give you a lot of options of what you can do if you want to put a picture out there. Uh, we've got the Christmas service shown there. Of course, we want to put a time and date, but you can do a lot of things with it. You want to get as much as you can. Uh, you don't want to buy obsolescence, so it, it's expensive to do that. Uh, how are we going to pay for that? Well, first of all, if you look at the um, our printout of the budget, there's actually two uh, funds in there for signs. There's match sign. One fun that when I did this, this was back in December, so they may have changed just a little bit. But at the time, it was $625. And then there's a renovation church sign, $3,345. If you add those up, that gives us $3,970. Um, so if we take that out of it, out of the $42,000, that means that we will owe $38,030. We have a match fund account coming from the sale of the after school building of $44,056 and a nickel. If we subtract that, that will actually leave us money in that account. So we have the money to pay for it on hand, so that's not going to be an issue. Where are we going to put it? Well, right now we currently have a sign out there that says First Baptist Church, and that's about it. So we want it approximately in that location. Uh, we are governed by a couple of things. Number one, it's got to be 12 feet from the street right away. It must also be 10 feet from any property line. The property line is not going to be an issue. Uh, a couple of other things we are also set up. Signs cannot distract drivers. So it, it's got to change in an orderly fashion. It can't change rapidly. We don't want someone driving and wrecking trying to read the sign. Uh, it's got to take place at a deliberate pace. Um, couple of things to add. It's also um, it will be set up to have certain levels of brightness. Of course, during the daytime, you're going to need more brightness than at night. So, you know, we don't, don't want to blind the neighbors and things like that. All right, that's a run through of what the information you have. Is there any questions? Yes.
It'll be at a 90 degree angle, yes. Perpendicular to the road, two sides, yes. That way we can cover people going one way or the other. Yes? There is a five year warranty on the electronics and a one year on the workmanship. It is, a, in our opinion of the committee, it is the, one of the best advertising techniques because even with the bypass, there is still a pretty healthy flow of traffic in and out of Troy. And if you, you know, if you, if you think about it, and some of you will know, remember what I'm talking about, there used to be a church going out of Troy, going towards, uh, going towards uh, Albemarle. I think it was the. Church of God, maybe I'm not sure. Of the, I don't remember that it's, my memory is fading. But they had a sign out there, and every day, the pa every week, the pastor put some other biblical principle on the sign. People noticed that. Now, did it bring them in? I don't know, but they did notice it because they talked about it at West Montgomery. So signs do get noticed. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, that is one a deacon. That's a deacon question. I know last time it was 12 to 12.30 so I would guess that same time I would say if you're waiting in line at 12.30 it would be like the public polls they'll let you vote anyone else Mr. Moderator and if you come up with another question please let me know I'll try to get you an answer Thank you very much, Mr. Poole. Yes, Bonnie. Um, I'll recognize Bryant Hampton. 51%. Yeah, a majority, so anything greater than 50. Yes, Ms. Barton. So what Mr. Hampton was saying with Ms. Barden was that uh, a quorum will be required, which is 15% of the active membership, which will be uh, tabulated and calculated before the vote. All right. Um, do we have any other miscellaneous business for the good of the church? Hearing none, I will, oh, I'm sorry. I did, uh, Bryant gave me a signal to remind me. Yep, I already forgot. Um, it was brought up. And I think it's a good idea. Um, it was that we wanted to mention and remind to everyone online and even here that the um, vaccination was uh, the availability of the vaccination was lowered to the age of 65, and wanted to encourage uh, folks that didn't know how to do that. Um, and I've already forgot what Bryant told me that they needed to go to the uh, library and pick up a form. Is that So library, then to tax office to a drop box. So you go and get a form, and then you drop that off. And that's for anybody uh, 65 years of age or above um, to go ahead and get signed up for the vaccine. Um, we had a member that called wanted to make sure we mentioned that, and I think it's a good idea to remind everyone how to do that. Any other miscellaneous business? All right, hearing none, I'll close this in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this time and this opportunity that we can come together and worship you and praise you, Lord. Give thanks to you for everything you've done for us. Your grace, your mercy is abundant all over us, Lord, and we thank you for that. Please be with us as we leave this building, Lord, and help us share you, show your mercy and love to those around us, and remember that we must love our neighbors. We must love our neighbors if you have loved us, Lord. It's in your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.